Welcome back everyone. We'd like to introduce you to the first of what we hope to be a multi-part series entitled Behind the Drought, where we take a look at the reasons behind the southwestern water shortage other than the drought itself. And as we pull in here, you're going to see the subject of our first episode, Lake Las Vegas in Henderson, Nevada. Some people were asking in the comments, where is all the green at in Las Vegas? Well, you're going to get a glimpse of where it's at. It's going to be more and more only in the neighborhoods that can afford it, like this one. And as soon as you enter the community here, you're going to see a beautiful artificial water feature. If you look in the background, you'll notice it's coming from a waterfall up on the hillside and the water is being pumped up there. A look across the road, you'll get the first glimpse of one of the golf courses here in Lake Las Vegas. And you can see the stark contrast of the bright green grass against the desert background. Why this area is so desirable. So as we head down into the heart of Lake Las Vegas, I'd like to quickly first share with you why I chose Lake Las Vegas as the subject of this first episode. I don't want anyone to think that they are being singled out unnecessarily, so I wanted to follow the data and the numbers, and this is where I ended up. So I started looking for reports of who or what was using the most water in the valley. As you might recall from last video, nearly all of our indoor water in southern Nevada is treated and returned to Lake Mead. The water that we use outdoors is the water that we only use once. That's really the water that we consume as a community. The bathtub ring around Lake Mead is perhaps the starkest reminder of how much water our community has lost, but there's another lake that has no ring, and it's the biggest commercial water user of all. Lake Las Vegas and Henderson used some 1.2 billion gallons of water in 2020, well over twice the next highest water user. As of 2021, they used 1.3 billion gallons. They actually increased their water usage from 2020. And here's another important point. Henderson officials tell us raw water is taken directly from Lake Mead to replenish Lake Las Vegas. This will help me to clear up another important point brought up by commenter Tony Bader in the last video. Tony commented, Lake Las Vegas is not filled by the wash. The wash goes underneath Lake Las Vegas. I responded, thank you, Tony. I'm looking into this and I will do a follow-up. And that's what I'm here to do today also. We're going to cover all of this in today's video, so stay tuned. We're headed up Lake Las Vegas Boulevard, pictured right here towards the lake. And as we pan out, you're going to get an overview of the lake itself. Here's a nice aerial shot. So you might be wondering, how did this oasis in the desert come to be? Who built Lake Las Vegas? How did it get started? Well, let's have a look. Lake Las Vegas is a 320-acre body of water surrounded by condos, hotels, housing, shops, and a beautiful golf course, which should be plural now, golf courses. About 20 miles from the iconic Las Vegas Strip, you'll find the scenic Italian-style village near the heart of Henderson, Nevada. Let's take a look at how it began. In 1967, actor and businessman J. Carlton Adair conceived the idea of a man-made body of water in the middle of the desert. At this time, he purchased not only the land, but the water rights of the property. His goal was to boost the economy of Henderson by turning the location into a booming tourist spot. Long story short, unfortunately, he failed, and after 20 years of planning and no construction, he filed for bankruptcy. Here's some historic satellite imagery of the Lake Las Vegas area and Las Vegas Wash before the lake was created. You can see the wash just continues from the city right on through to Lake Mead. Well, fast forward a bit. In 1987, another businessman and real estate mogul, Ronald Boldicker, acquired the land from the government who owned it at the time. In 1990, a corporation that he founded acquired the property and started work on it. A little bit later after that, more people got on board, like the former chairman of Caesars World Casino, Henry Gluck, and billionaire investors Sid and Lee Bass. At the time, the project was valued at $5 billion in 1995. Here's where we get on to how it was actually created. 
With the financial support and investment, the plans were slowly being executed. An estimated 3 billion gallons of water were diverted from Lake Mead to the reservoir to fill the lake. A separate massive dam was also built to keep the supply full. Lake Las Vegas sits on top of the Las Vegas Wash. The wash consists of two 12 mile long pipes which flow water from the valley and through Henderson City. This design also allows Lake Mead to continuously supply water to Lake Las Vegas. When it was created, the wash was diverted and that was used to fill it completely. After being filled, Lake Las Vegas is maintained with raw water directly from Lake Mead, which became a problem in later years, as we'll find out. Let's see how the wash transformed over the years. We're going to take a look at the west side of Lake Las Vegas, and we're also going to go back in time to 1985, when Jay Carlton Adair left the property bankrupt. And you can tell there wasn't much going on here when he left it. Fast forward just a few short years, and you already see that the wash had been diverted and the lake was being filled. As the community started to pop up around the lake, so did the golf courses and resorts. We're going to go back to 1988 and watch the lake form. In the area of the yellow arrow, you're going to notice some grading work begin, and then the eastern edge of the earthen dam is formed. By the end of December 1992, the wash had been diverted and the lake was flooded. And into the early 2000s, you can watch the infrastructure build up around it. Now we're going to go boots on the ground and check out this wash bypass. And here we are in front of the bypass. You can clearly say the Las Vegas wash is going through the grating and down underground through the miles of tunnel underneath Lake Las Vegas and out the other side near the bottom of the dam where it continues on its way to Lake Mead. You'll also notice in the background the overflow channel where the floodwater is allowed to pass into Lake Las Vegas if they get too high. And panning over to the right here, you'll notice Lake Las Vegas Boulevard and the lake starts just on the other side of the road. Let's head across the bridge and we're going to go down onto the Lake Las Vegas side and get a perspective of the lake itself. And we'll be going through this little area right here along the lake. Here you're going to get your first look at Lake Las Vegas. It really is an oasis in the desert. Let's continue where we left off. Throughout the mid-2000s, everything seemed to finally be on the up and up for Lake Las Vegas. That is, until 2007. In 2007, developers had to foreclose the project after defaulting on loans amounting to $540 million. A year later, in 2008, the project went into bankruptcy. From there, it suffered many blows. Hotel room rates dropped, foreclosures increased, golf courses closed, new property sales dried up, and lawsuits were all filed. In 2010, Lake Las Vegas finally recovered yet again from bankruptcy with all existing debt wiped off and a $30 million budget to complete unfinished infrastructure projects. In 2012, most recently, much of the land was bought by Raintree Investment Corporation. Together with new investors, work has resumed to slowly rebuild Lake Las Vegas, from the golf courses and hotels to residential areas and other infrastructure. And boy, have they ever resumed. We're going to take a look a little bit later at what's being dubbed as an island community being constructed in Lake Las Vegas. And in the back of the Hilton here, you're going to see yet another artificial water feature. And as I look at this, I can't help but think that in the 110 degree heat, it just acts like a big evaporator. And you also see it looks like they tried to make a little private beach here for the event area. So as I'm heading down the path here, thinking about water waste and all the new regulations, I spotted this flow of water going down the path and into the lake. It actually looked like it had been engineered to flow this way. So I went to take a closer look. And here you can see what looks like one of the pumps that supplies the waterfall is old and worn out and shooting water everywhere. 
Now, I find it kind of hard to swallow that the city wants me to report others for wasting water or having broken drip lines or watering at the wrong times. Yet I know this is down here going 24 seven in the heat of the summer. I can't imagine with all the landscape and maintenance crews in this place that no one knows this is happening. And you'll see it looks like it's been going on for so long it's damaged the pavers and they just crumple away as the water goes down back into the lake. Here we're going to get a look at the back side of the overflow tunnel. And I actually have some footage from just a few days ago after all of the flooding of the last few weeks. And you'll be able to see how the Las Vegas wash overflow has helped fill the lake to the brim. And there it is, you can see the water is going right up to the tunnel bottom. And as the wash fills up and overflows, it brings water with it. Unfortunately, also brings all the trash from the Las Vegas city area. I actually saw maintenance crews in the lake during the week trying to dredge out all the trash that had come through the wash. Now that we're done at the back side of the Hilton property here, we're going to get back in the Jeep and head over this way through the village. And here we are coming down towards the village. On the left you're going to see the closed Montalago Casino. More on that in a little bit. The village was designed exclusively as a retail and recreation space for Lake Las Vegas residents. It originally contained high-end luxury and boutique shops meant for a select clientele. As we come down here in the modern day, you're going to see a whole lot of new construction going on on both sides of this area. On the right, there is a new terrace community being built, and down directly in front of us, there is a new, even more exclusive shoreline community being built right along the waterline. And here's the sales office for the new shoreline community. Now usually you'd see a price advertised on these billboards, like starting at the low 400,000s. But this one doesn't have a price and it says by appointment only. I'm guessing a lot of these are spoken for. And if you have to ask the price, it's probably not the place for you. Here's an aerial view of the new shoreline community. Now we're going to head right next to that and into the village to check out what's going on in there. And as we enter the village here, you can really see it has a Tuscan style theme going. They really did a good job down here. Good to see a lot of shops opening back up and new restaurants and tenants filling the spaces. It wasn't always like this. And I remember walking by these stores before and thinking it was like the Las Vegas Strip and who would shop in those type of stores. It seemed like they were never getting any business. This article from Vegas Inc. explains why. The village used to be heavy on luxury goods with practically nothing that appealed to the everyday shopper crowd. He remembers, for instance, when visitors could buy a $20,000 hand-blown glass jellyfish. It's funny, but it's not a joke, he said. Now that we're done in this new development area, we're going to head out and we're going to go back up around to the North Shore side of the lake where there's a lot more new development going on back here. I want to tell you about the Casino Montalago that we passed on the way in. It's sad to see this place closed. I clearly remember going through those front doors there and hidden some slots on my way down through the casino and out the back door on the ground level to go down to the lake for a drink. So what happened to this place and why did it never reopen? Here's a little more info. Towering over the retail district is the former Casino Montalago, now dubbed the Lake Las Vegas Event Center. The casino opened in 2003, closed in 2010 when the adjacent Ritz-Carlton shut its doors, 
reopened in 2011 to a fireworks show and throngs of gamblers, then closed again in 2013 and has been closed since. At the time, management said it suspended operations pending a resolution of lease issues with the property owners. They did not elaborate. I'm still not really sure what's going on here. Is there an issue between the village and the property owners? I don't know. Let me know in the comments below if you do. Here we're on the north side of the lake now, exiting the western resort. And for all the people that asked where the green was in Las Vegas and what we're watering, this shot is for you once again. Outside of this community here, around the Las Vegas Valley, a lot of this grass would probably be deemed non-essential. Some of it, they may even require you to rip off, but not in this community. More and more, it looks like as long as you can afford it and you live in the right spot, you're free to water away. We're approaching the crest of this hill towards the new development area, and you're going to get your first look at the island community being developed in Lake Las Vegas. Here's some new lots being constructed on the hillside. And back there in the background, jutting out like a finger into the lake, is the new island community being constructed. Let's take a moment to explore this new community being developed right in this area here. Island housing development being built at Lake Las Vegas. It goes on to say the island, quote unquote, is a new housing development underway on the northern part of Lake Las Vegas across the lake from South Shore. We will accomplish this by taking a natural channel of the lake, entrenching it and enlarging it so that we can connect that water all the way around the island. Northrop said the development is about outdoor recreation and enjoying waterfront properties not far from the Las Vegas Strip. Here's an important caveat. Our custom lots will start at approximately $1.2 million. Our semi-custom homes will start at approximately $2 million, he said. Property owners will have a variety of options on the island, from anyone that wants to do a small single story to an incredible $10 million estate, we have the ability to accommodate you. He doesn't say if they have the water to, but I guess they've already planned for that. This is a view from the new lots on the island. In front of us, you're going to see the main arm of the island sticking out into the lake. And just behind where I'm standing will be where the canal is trenched out and flooded with water to make this a pseudo island. Now that we're done talking about this area here in the new island community, we're going to head on back out of Lake Las Vegas all the way around into Lake Mead. And I'm going to come up here back on North Shore and take a look at this back area here where the Las Vegas wash pipes exit from underneath Lake Las Vegas and out into the wash. And it appears to be right here, so we're going to try and get a look at this area right down in here. Taking a look at the desert terrain surrounding Lake Las Vegas, and you can see the community sits like a little lush oasis in the middle of the valley there. We're headed through the entrance booth and into the park. Here's the Las Vegas wash below the Lake Las Vegas dam after it exits the bypass pipes. And you can see how historically high the floodwaters were when they carved up this canyon. Now they are constrained to the size of the discharge pipe in the Las Vegas wash. A lot of people were also wondering what happens when Las Vegas floods. Does it really fill Lake Mead back up? According to the Water District, the Las Vegas wash only compromises about 2% of the total amount of water in Lake Mead during the year. So even with heavy flooding, it still doesn't really make that much of a difference in Lake Mead's water level. That being said, the lake did rise about 2 feet with all the flooding from the last few weeks. That will only be temporary as a drain on the lake will be faster than the supply of flood water. In order to better document this, I'm going to start color coding all the water supply reports that I share. As you can see from this week's report, compared to the beginning of the month, the content has gone up 
the elevation of the water level has gone up and the seven day release has gone down, surprisingly. Here's a beautiful shot of Lava Butte. At the toe of Lava Butte, you're going to see a series of terraces that are being carved out for hilltop homes. Below that, just to the right, you're going to see the back of Lake Las Vegas Dam. So who is doing all this construction? Do they know there's a water shortage here? Do they care? We're going to examine some of these developers that are actually building in Lake Las Vegas in these brand new areas and the most exclusive ones. Paulson, founder of hedge fund operator Paulson & Company, made billions betting against subprime mortgages. He also invested in Lake Las Vegas when prices were cheap. In summer 2012, he bought a reported 875 plus acres of land for $17.3 million, or about $20,000 per acre. RY Properties of Alhambra, California bought 127 acres for $12.5 million in late 2014. According to listing brokers, previous owners paid $47 million for the land a decade earlier, and then they spent another $16.3 million on improvements. So look at the difference between this. This is going to be quite the payoff for these developers. Are you starting to get an idea? why no matter what the water shortage says or how much people are alarmed why they're still going to come in and keep building houses this is why other county records show that san diego investment firm pacifica companies bought the 493 room weston lake las vegas hotel property out of foreclosure in december the company paid 25 million 84 percent less than what previous owners paid in 2006. Custom home builder Philip Kafka, founder of Level Development Group, lives and works in Lake Las Vegas. He says, the lake is a resource that will never be duplicated in the West. Amid water concerns, and there are so many things happening in the community that are so positive. So the custom home builder here isn't even admitting that at this point, it'll never be duplicated. I'm guessing mainly because of the amount of water it wastes. Another funny quote from this guy to end the article here is, For the life of me, I can't understand why people aren't lined up to move here. The custom home builder said, You can't understand why people aren't lined up to move here. To me, it seems like what might be happening is California builders and developers who have employed their scorched earth tactics in their home state and basically priced the middle class out of home ownership have ran out of customers and have now gone to neighboring states and to wealthy communities to do the same. And what would it really matter to them? It's not like most of them are like Philip Kafka. They're not going to live in the community after the water's all gone in a few years. And speaking of running out of water, here's a good spot to share an article that just came out a few weeks ago. It's been reported that Lake Las Vegas has lost its water supply, according to a report by KLAS-TV. But a solution is already on tap, a real estate developer assures the TV station. We already discussed how Lake Las Vegas has to be continually fed by an intake pipe from Lake Mead to avoid evaporating. Behind this problem is the fact that Lake Las Vegas was being supplied by water by the Basic Water Company, which had been operating the Lake Mead intake number one. The problem arose when the water level dropped earlier this year and Lake Mead intake number one became non-functional. But there is no cause for alarm, at least not according to one Lake Las Vegas developer. She told KLAS that a different set of pipes is already in place and ready to feed the lake from the city of Henderson's water supply, which would be the second and third intake. In a recent statement, Cody Winterton, president of Raintree Investment Corporation, admitting that the crisis occurred about two months sooner than expected, he said the paperwork for the new water deal should be finalized within two to three weeks, and that should be right about the time I'm posting this video. He goes on to say Lake Las Vegas is a customer of the city of Henderson and has a commitment from the city to provide water to maintain the lake, Winterton said. And this seems like a little bit of posturing going on here to me. A city of Henderson spokesperson told KLAS that Lake Las Vegas prepared in advance to weather the interruption in service. They did so by pumping an additional 200 million gallons of water into the lake during the transition. So in order to weather the storm of drought, they actually took more water out of Lake Mead during the drought in order to fill their lake. 
how long term this solution will remain to be seen. And this is what I would be worried about. If your developers who are blazing housing tracks up through the whole community can't even correctly predict a few months out for their water usage, do you really think they're going to be able to predict accurately throughout the lifetime of your mortgage? And if they seem to be doing it with all the good graces of our local government and leadership, then who's really to blame? Now before I get a bunch of my wonderful Lake Las Vegas neighbors down in the comments below all worked up, I want to zoom back out to cruising altitude and let's take a look at the bigger picture here. From this diagram, you can see at the very tippy tippy top, Nevada only uses 0.3 million acre feet of water a year. Down at the very, very bottom is California, who uses 4.4 million acre feet per year. So even as extraordinary as we made the Lake Las Vegas water usage seem in this episode, it's still literally not even a drop in the bucket compared to what our downstream neighbors are using for irrigation. In future episodes, we'll be looking at who the biggest wasters of the Colorado River are. We'd like to thank you again for tuning in. And we'll see you next time for another episode where we find out what's really behind the drought.